Hi, I'm Laura Fisher, archivist here at the Peterson Automotive Museum, and welcome back to our Unboxing the Archives series. Today we're celebrating Earth Day by taking a look at the history of alternative power. So, boiler alert, our first example is actually steam. The first documented attempt at a steam-powered vehicle is actually in 1769 by Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, who was French. Um, while his vehicle was a little cumbersome, it did prove that steam power was viable, and we would go on to have steam-powered farming equipment and, of course, locomotives. But what about steam-powered vehicles? Well, fast forward to the year around 1900, turn of the century, we have the Stanley Steam Engine. The Stanley Motor Carriage Company uh, was started in Massachusetts, and they ended up producing steam-powered vehicles for a few decades. Now, this particular model is a two-cylinder, and you'll notice that it's actually quite simple in comparison to an internal combustion engine. And that's because this particular piece would be connected to the axle and you would have a boiler where you would have the steam generated. Steam engines actually rely on a very important fact about steam. It can create constant pressure. Now because of that, you don't need a gearbox or a transmission. In relation, that constant pressure helps steam engines create more torque in relation to their horsepower. So this two-cylinder actually can create almost as much power as a V8 internal combustion engine. A lot of these Stanley steamers could out-accelerate anything else produced at the time. We have land speed records of steam engines and vehicles around 1906 going about 127 miles per hour. While not impressive to us today, it certainly was impressive at the time. Now steam engines of course rely on water um, in the boiler and so the disadvantages are that you can only really go as far as as much water as you can carry and they did take a long time to heat up. It's almost like boiling a pot of water. And the interesting thing though is that the fuels that you can use to boil that water can really be anything because it's an external combustion engine in some way. Um, you can use kerosene, wood, coal, and while those don't sound very clean, the idea is that you can use any kind of fuel to generate that heat. So cleaner options certainly are available, especially in 2021. Now, the exploration of alternative power has actually been going on for over a century. It's very topical today, of course. We have a lot of electric vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles on the market. But we've been exploring this topic for a long time, and I certainly have a lot of things in the archive to share with you that are good examples of that exploration. First thing, of course, we're gonna do is put on our gloves. edit this. <laughs> Should I redo that? Some of the archival finds of early alternative power I have for you today are in the form of photographs. You'll notice that while these are great at storing archival material, they're not very graceful at having to show you archival material. <laughs> Now, this first example I have is from the Beardsley Electric Company. This particular postcard is a promotional postcard dated 1916, and Beardsley Electric was actually a California native company, and this particular electric vehicle was marketed as the perfect vehicle for Pacific Coast roads and climate. So you can see even back then automotive manufacturers were trying to engineer cars to specific climates, and of course, one of the car capitals of the United States. Moving forward to just 1918, we have a picture of Glen L. Martin with his natural gas powered vehicle. Now, Glen Martin was a engineer and inventor. He built a lot of aircraft for the Allies during World War II but his engineering company actually goes back a long time. He was always interested in trying new things in regards to fuels for not only vehicles, but also aerospace. You might recognize the name Martin. His company actually still exists in some form in the defense and aerospace company Lockheed Martin. 
Moving forward to 1927, we have a fun um, sail-powered vehicle. Now this is actually a Spanish Queen Victoria on a beach uh, enjoying a sail-powered vehicle. They're still actually made today as recreational vehicles for beachgoers, but it is fun to see people exploring the idea of a wind-powered vehicle. The next photo I have for you is actually really fun. Um, it is a human-powered car because it's a pedal car. And as you can see, these gentlemen are actually going down Fairfax away from the Peterson Automotive Museum building. And it's actually right there, and there's the May Company building as well. I had to share this one with you because anything involving the museum is always fun to look at. The next photo I have for you depicts electrical engineer Harry Grabke around 1975. And this is actually one of the earliest attempts at a plug-in hybrid. Grebke took eight 12 volt truck batteries and connected them to a turbine engine in an old station wagon. And what's interesting about it is that the turbine engine actually generated electricity for the batteries as it drove. And while it did take traditional fuel as well, it increased that fuel efficiency for the vehicle. And it could go up to 50 miles on the batteries alone. So the next example of an electric vehicle I have for you actually comes from GM. This is a precursor to GM's very famous EV1. This is 1977 and this is the El Carrito. You'll notice it's actually quite small, which is true of a lot of electric vehicles. And that's because we wanted electric vehicles to go as far as possible and have as much power as possible. So we do that by decreasing their mass. And as technology advances, we have been able to get electric vehicles even bigger and have more utility to them. A good example of that is my next photo, which depicts a Pacific Telephone work truck that was actually an electric work truck. And so this is a good example of companies trying to incorporate electric vehicles into their fleet vehicles, not only to increase public awareness about electric vehicles, but they also were proving possibly to be a little bit cheaper to run as fleet vehicles. You'll notice that a lot of this technology was really gearing up in the 1970s, and that really has to do a lot with the oil crisis of 1973. With oil prices getting higher and higher, vehicle manufacturers were trying to find other ways to approach vehicle power. In 1980, when oil prices dropped again, you'll see that a lot of these manufacturers kind of abandoned alternative fuel projects until the 1990s when environmental policies would help encourage electric vehicles yet again. As I mentioned earlier, GM would go on to create the EV1. It was one of the first mass-produced electric vehicles, and they made about 1,100 of them from 1996 to 1999. It was a lease-only program, meaning that the people who got them had to return them at the end of the lease, and they ended the program in 2003. The program got quite a cult following, and people loved their EV1s. Unfortunately, only 40 of the EV1s survive for education, researchers, and museums such as ours. Our EV1 is in fact one of the 40 surviving EV1s. I have for you a few fun items related to the EV1. The first item I actually have for you is the window sticker. Yes, we have a surviving unused window sticker from the EV1. These are always fun to look at because these are the kinds of things that kind of get thrown away or lost in time. And so it's fun to look back at how the EV1 was marketed and presented to consumers. In addition to that, we also have press kits related to the EV1. And these are important because GM really marketed the EV1 aggressively, and people were starting to really become interested in electric vehicles. Here's another press kit, but this one's actually in a binder, and this format's actually pretty common for vehicle press kits during the 90s and early 2000s. Now a lot of press kits are on flash drives or sent digitally. Um, they're a little flashier, you can see there's always specs and marketing information, and majority of press kits also include slides that display the car. And what's marketing in the 90s without marketing to kids as well? This here is a book produced by GM called Daniel and His Electric Car, and you can see there is a cartoon version of the EV1 being charged, and it is a kid's book talking about electric vehicles. If you get the kids, then you get the parents. 
Now, while those items are fun, I always like to show 3D artifacts as well. I have here a, what looks like a box of robot parts, <laughs> but it's actually a couple of examples of electric vehicle charging. Now, the first example I have for you is a portable charger for the EV1. Now, this came in the trunk of the EV1 we have on display. Now, the interesting thing about the EV1 is that it was charged via induction. Induction charging is still popular today. You'll see it on modern wireless charging smartphones or say your electric toothbrush. But Michael Faraday actually introduced the law of induction in 1831. And what it does is basically explain the production of electrical action across an electrical conductor in relation to a changing or moving magnetic field, thus electromagnetism. Now, induction doesn't require any open components with the conductor. So it's actually very beneficial for things like cars because you can charge it in the rain, right? So there's less corrosion, less risk of shorting the circuit, and of course, shock. Um, the only thing about inductive charging, though, is that it is less efficient. So it took a lot longer to charge things through induction, and it can be a little more expensive for the components. They did phase out, but it was widely popular at the time that it came to the market. GM actually had its own proprietary inductive charging mechanism called MagnaCharge. It was produced by the GM subsidiary Delco Electronics. As inductive charging phased out, we now have a more standard charging port for electric vehicles. And this particular one is from a Tesla Model S. Uh, 2012. As you can see, theirs is actually a little bit different from the standard we have today. It is more standardized now in 2021, um, but of course Tesla provides adapters for different charging ports. But most electric vehicle charging ports do look like this, and they have been improved for safety to prevent shock and corrosion. So the last item I have to share with you today is kind of fun and quirky. This is a trunk lid from an EV1. Now, you'll notice it has a lot of signatures on it. This trunk lid was donated to the museum by a gentleman named Chris Trexler. Now, the day he got his EV1, he signed the inside of the trunk lid for fun. And as he came across celebrities that were interested in his EV1, he had them sign as well. He loved his EV1 so much that he decided to take it on a cross-country trip to the Michigan factory where it was built. And at first, GM was a little worried about his trip because if it broke down along the way, it would be really bad publicity for the EV1. But EV1 made it all the way to Michigan, no problem. And along the way, he had GM personnel sign the inside of the trunk as well. GM was so excited about his trip and how successful it was and what great publicity it was that when he turned in his EV1, they gave him the trunk lid that had all the signatures on it and had a lot of press about the trip. While this is kind of a quirky piece that we have in our collection, I think it's fun because it exemplifies how excited people were about the EV1 and how much they really embraced the idea of alternative power. The things I shared with you today are just some of the stories we have in our archive that talk about the human exploration into alternative power and fuel. And I think it's really important that we recognize all the scientists and engineers, sometimes working for big companies, sometimes working on their own, who believed in the idea of alternative power as we move into the future. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I personally want to remind you to stay curious, keep learning, and I'll see you next time.